morning, church. I greet you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is truly the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, just a, a few announcements this morning. Uh, we will have Bible study uh, Monday morning at 10 and choir practice will be Tuesday at 6 30. Wednesday, when they changed it, Wednesday at 6 30. Change that in my book. Wednesday at 6 30. Uh, the Chase Corner Ministry is still in need of volunteers. And, um, so uh, if you feel the need, uh, come by the mission and help out. Uh, on March 26th, from 8 to 2, it'll be a church wide yard sale. And I think uh, we talked about setting up in, in the uh, uh, Family Life Center. It'd probably be a, a convenient place just to bring your stuff and leave it there and then we'll go through and separate it out and we'll be ready for the yard sale. Uh, so if you have things at your house you, that are in your way and you want to get rid of them, just bring them over here and we'll see what we can do. Uh, let's see. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Yes. She won't be in attendance because she'll be probably in and out with the family. Okay. And so. Well, we can we can put it off for another week. It'll be another week to get warmer. Thank you, Pastor Bill. I appreciate your. <laughs> That's no problem. Uh, just on that on that note, there are several birthdays we need to uh, remember. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Dot Desmers is next Monday, is this coming Monday. Uh, Michelle Suits is uh, the 25th. And Dave and Pam Cochran are celebrating their wedding anniversary on the 28th. And guess what? Nikki Nicholson's birthday is on the 29th. So happy birthday to everybody and happy anniversaries to those that are celebrating. And got a lot going on. Well, let us stand for a call to worship. You have the, uh, we're going to do it as a congregation this morning. And you have uh, the song printed in your bulletin, so let's stand and sing. You want to you play it through one time, and then we can, so the congregation can hear it, and then we'll sing it.
Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this glorious day that you've created just for us, for our enjoyment, for our pleasure. And so, gracious Heavenly Father, we ask that you pour out your Spirit upon us and bless us on this glorious day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is The Church's One Foundation. And I do have a little blurb about that. So. Samuel J. Stone, lived from 1839 to 1900, wrote this hymn as one of 12 published in Lyra Fidelian, 12 hymns of the 12 articles of the Apostles' Creed in 1866. At the time of his publication, Stone was a young priest at New Windsor Parish Church, a poor district in Babington, Oxford, in England. Earlier, during his education at Charterhouse, he won a prize from com for composition and English verse. He continued his education at Pembroke College in Oxford and leading to his ordination as a deacon in 1862 and as an Anglican priest in 1863. Controversy over critical biblical methodologies was heating up. Interestingly enough, the theological battle over the nature of the Bible was waged not in the island of Great Britain, but by two bishops serving in South Africa. One of Stone's hymns was composed in support of the conservative stance promoted by the Bishop of Cape Town, Robert Gray. Gray defended his tradition, traditional dating and authorship of the Pentateuch. And you know, the Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible. An adversarial position was advocated by, by his popular colleague, Bishop John William Colenso of Natal, South Africa. The animosity between these two South African bishops resulted in an unsuccessful attempt by Bishop Gray to remove Bishop Colenso from his post and have him excommunicated. The Church's One Foundation speaks specifically to Article 9 of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. The hymn itself is based on 1 Corinthians 3.11. For, for other foundations, can man can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Please stand for the singing of the church's one foundation.
faith. Of our Christian faith. I believe in God, in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end Let's now prepare ourselves to worship God and his tithes and our offerings. Our ushers will please come forward. Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit on this time of giving, this time of receiving. Let our hearts rejoice in you as you return a portion of what you have blessed us with. All for the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, bless these gifts and these tithes been so generously given by your people here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We move now into our prayer time. And who has God laid upon your hearts this day? Well, I just pray for safe travels for my be home. They're driving home today. And um, for my granddaughter, Erin, who will be driving home from Tahiti today.
We had uh, in our Sunday school class, we also had Ed Basker, his wife. friend who's in the hospital right now. Uh, he's on a ventilator with COVID, and so his name is John Baker, so I'm going to add him to our list this morning. morning that Queen Elizabeth also has COVID. So she's up there in years. So is there anyone else? What choice has God given you this week? We had a very nice trip, a nice vacation. It's good to be away, but it's good to be back as well. I miss my cats. <laughs> my cats miss me too. They've been all over me since I've been back. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks again for this beautiful day. We give you thanks for one another and, and this fellowship here at this church, gracious God. And we just love you so much. And, but we have some folks to lift up for you. I want to lift up uh, Ed Bosker's wife. I want to lift up Clifford Green to you. I want to lift up um, Tyler um, Davis to you, gracious Heavenly Father. We want to lift up Johnny Baker. There's so many on our prayer list. Uh, we'll lift up uh, Aaron, who is uh, Ronnie and, and Debbie's uh, granddaughter. Uh, to you, gracious God, we want to ask for traveling nice graces for, um, for Mike and Yvonne as they're coming back from their trip. And we just had so much to be thankful for too, gracious God, and we just thank you for looking after us, and we know that you will you will be beside these people throughout their journey as, as they as they um, travel through this illness and, and whatever illness that they may have, gracious God, we know that you're going to be there for them. And so, gracious Heavenly Father, we we give them to you and ask that you care for them. Be with us. Be with all your people here. Be with all your people who are meeting elsewhere, gracious God, and other, other denominations, other uh, venues of worship. And so gracious God, we bless you and we thank you. And we know that you're going to bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. And it is in Jesus' name that we offer up this prayer that we taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Started watching videos and playing games all night. 
So she was up to 12 and 1 that night playing video games. So then she um, woke up the next morning. She was really tired because she'd been up all night playing on her phone. And she told her mama she was sick because she was so tired she just wanted to go back to bed and she didn't want to go to school. So she lied to her mama and told her she was sick. Then that afternoon, she snuck into the kitchen and stole three cookies out of the cookie jar right before dinner when she knew she couldn't have cookies till after dinner. So she ate those cookies. So, you know, Bunny's just been doing some craziness. Do you think Bunny's been a good bunny? What's she been? Bad. Bad. That's what I thought. I thought, what a bad bunny. But, you know, if you think about it, we all make mistakes. You know, um, most of us cheated somehow in school, probably you, no, not you, because you're too smart to have to do that. Or, you know, told a little white lie. Um, you know, everybody does that. It's really called sins. So, the Bible tells us, and let me find what I wrote about it. Um, well, I can't find it, but Pretty much what the Bible says is don't judge other people because you'll be judged the same way. So I'm thinking if I get to heaven and I thought Bunny was doing all this bad stuff and I was judging him and he's a bad bunny and he's been sinning and I've been doing the same thing, then God's going to say, oh, you're a bad woman. You know, you sinned. So you just, we have to try not to judge people from doing bad things, but we can help them like our friends if we know that they're doing like Bunny did, and they're cheating, or they're swiping your cookies out of the cookie jar. You know, we can talk to them and, and tell them, you know, that's not the thing that you should do. Talk to your mom, and I bet she'll give you an extra cookie every day, or, you know, just try a way to help your friends that when they're doing something wrong, and our, keep our heart in the right place so that we won't be judging them. And we're trying to help them. We can pray for them if nothing else. If we don't want to talk to them about it, you know, we can pray and ask God to help them not to do the bad things that they've been doing and to help us not to do the bad things that we do every day. Because I know every day there's something that I, at least one or 20 things that I have to ask God to forgive me for. And so it's just, you know, it's just really are not to judge people, but we have to try because we don't want to be judged the same way. And so God gives us our heart so that we can love people and not judge them. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all your blessings. Thank you that we can come to church and learn about your word and learn how you want us to act. Be with us this week and help for us to uh, do right and to not judge others and to pray for other people. In Jesus' name, amen. I was thinking about that one in 20 things and how true, how true that is. Not, not on your, on your uh, case, Julie, but I was thinking about myself. And that, that's very true. We have at least 20 things to ask God to forgive us for. Well, today, I'm, and guess what I'm going to be talking about today? I'm talking about judgment. And... Our scripture today comes to us from Matthew, from the seventh chapter, and it'll be verses one through five. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and
Here today comes to us from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And, you will, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, there's just no escaping it. We're all prone to criticizing and critiquing and judging those around us. We do it all the time. Some of it is lighthearted and innocent. Nice shoes, dude. Some of it is downright hateful. If you ask me, it's not worth a plug nickel. How many of us have heard that saying or, or said it ourselves? Whether we mean anything by it or not, Jesus teaches us not to judge others. What I'd like for us to take seriously this morning is the obvious question, how? How can we avoid being judgmental? There are four ways I can think of. The first three are old hat. First, admit to yourself that you'll never be able to know what another person is thinking or feeling, or why. Nor can you fully understand what motivates him or her to do the things they do. Who we are and how we act is complex. It goes all the way back to the moment we were conceived. It includes such things as heredity, the genes we carry, environment, the type of home life we grew up in, experiences we've had to date, both pleasant and painful. The people around us and how they've influenced, influenced us to think and act the way we do. No one knows how another person will think or feel or respond in a given situation. If we knew all the factors that go into a person's makeup, we wouldn't be so quick to judge. An old Indian aphorism, aphorism says it best. Don't criticize another man until you've walked a mile in his moccasins. And we've, we've kind of modernized it to say another man's shoes. I have a friend named Ken who is a little rough around the edges. But he has a heart of gold. I met him when we were in high school, and we became fast friends. He would come to my house, and I would go to his. I went to his wedding, and he came to mine. For a long time, my mother wondered why we were friends, because we were so different. Ken was about six foot two inches tall, and weighed about 350 pounds. His language was rough, and his mannerisms were uncouth to say the least. It was a kind of Mutt and Jeff relationship. It was not until my mom became ill that she understood why Ken was my friend. You cannot judge a book by its cover. Did I say Ken has a heart of gold? He was recently diagnosed with prostate cancer and is undergoing treatment. My mother began to see him the way I, what I saw in him all along, and she never questioned my friends again. Ken is the only high school friend who has followed me in my career as a minister through all the moves, through all the transitions. He has been a stalwart friend through the years. Many people underestimated him and would have dismissed him. That is why I give people multiple chances to redeem themselves when they hurt or disappoint me. It is what Jesus would have done and did do. Before you criticize or judge another person, 
think of someone you know like him and say to yourself, but by the grace of God, go I. Also remember that you see in others is only a part of a whole. Also remember that what you see in others is only a part of a whole. You may know them at work or at school or around town, but there's always more to it than meets the eye. Seldom do we know, get to know people in more than one or two facets of their lives. So before you judge, just remember that what you see in another person is only the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to them than you'll ever know. Also bear in mind that criticism says as much about the one who is being critical as it does about the one you're criticizing. And what, whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you, according to Matthew 17. We call this projection. We project our own faults on others. It has to do with blind spots, areas of our own lives that we're either unaware or in denial about. That is why it's not uncommon for a person who talks incessantly to criticize someone else for, guess what? Talking incessantly. A poor listener is the first to complain. He doesn't pay attention to a thing I say. Jesus put it this way. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but don't consider the beam that is in your own eye. You hypocrite. First remove the beam out of your own eye, and you can see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. We project our hang-ups on others because they mirror the parts of us. We're not being completely honest about. This is what Hugh Prather meant when he said, if something you, if something you do rankles me, I can be sure that your fault is my fault, too. Oddly enough, the tendency to be judgmental stems from a lack of self-esteem. A person who comes across as holier than thou is usually a person who doesn't think highly of themselves and so needs to put others down. It's as to say the more people you have under you, the higher your place in the pecking order of things. On the other hand, a person with positive self-esteem is usually humble and the first to complain, compliment and encourage others. This echoes what Paul said to Timothy when he wrote, the saying is faithful and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Paul was talking about himself. He said he was the chief sinner. We want to put Paul on a pedestal. We need to, Paul was also a man, a human being with human thoughts and failures. How can you stand in judgment of others when you know the magnitude of your own sinful nature? The bottom line is there are lots of reasons why we ought not to judge others. But the best reason of all, it's not our place to judge. God and God alone is the righteous judge before whom we all must stand, both now and on the judgment day. And I thank Jesus Christ that I'm covered with his blood and I can stand before God and Christ will be my advocate. He appointed me and said, and said, Bill is one of my own. I paid his price. I paid his cost. And God and Christ, and Christ will say the same thing about you. That he paid your bill. He paid for your sin. But in the meantime, there's a problem. We have to make judgment every day about our own lives and decide for ourselves what's right and what's wrong. Exercising good judgment is part of growing up. And it's not as if we live in isolation. 
we live in community with each other so that my judgment affect yours and others and other judgments affect me it's not enough to look the other way shrug your shoulders and say to yourself to each his own we have an obligation to speak up and if necessary confront others when they step outside the moors of the community paul told the galatians brothers even if a man is calling some fall you who are spiritual must restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness for well, herein lies the rub that borders on being judgmental who's to say what's right and what's wrong for another person how can we judge somebody who is not a christian by our own standards we must learn to love them for who they are before they're going to change they have to know that they are loved that they are cared for they have to know about who you are and about the person that you think they are and that they may become. The answer is not we who stand in judgment, but God and God has made his judgment clear in the writings of the Old and New Testament. I'm going to end with a story that is a little confusing unless you understand Leverite law. Leverite law is a law designed to protect women in ancient Jewish tradition. The law stated that a woman who was widowed would marry the nearest male relative and thereby bear children for her dead husband through his relative. That being said, we have the following tale. It's found in the 38th chapter of Genesis. The main characters are Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar. As the story goes, Judah has three sons. The oldest marries Tamar, but after a relatively short marriage, he dies. So the second son steps up and marries his brother's widow, but he too dies. Tamar asks to marry the third son, but Judah balks. He's too young, he says. He tells her to go back and live with her family. And when the boy grows up, he'll send for her. Sure he will. That's sarcasm, folks. Sure he will. Yeah. So she goes back to her family and waits. But of course, Judah has no intention of sending for her. So he takes matters in, his own, in her own hands. She dresses as a prostitute and sits by the side of the road where she knows Judah will pass. Sure enough, he approaches her and promises if she'll let him go, come into her tent, he'll give her a newborn lamb. He has no idea that it's his daughter-in-law. In the meantime, he promises to leave his signet cord for her to keep as a pledge until he comes back. When he comes back with the lamb, she is nowhere to be found. Three months later, he's told that she has played the harlot and is pregnant. He demands that she be put to death. On the day of her execution, she's brought out before the whole community and ridiculed. But before being burned at the stake, she has to say a final word. The crowd is hushed. She holds up Judah's signet and cord and says, It is by the honor of these that I am pregnant. Judah recognizes his signet in court and confesses, she is more righteous than I, and Tamar is set free. Friends, don't be judgmental. Do your best to live up to the teachings and example of Jesus and encourage others to do likewise. As far as any judgments need to be made, leave them to God and the authority of God's word. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got a log in my own eye I need to see about getting removed. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I close again. As God will take care of you. Let us stand and sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Faith shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Oh, yeah. 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 Y